Okay, hello everybody and welcome to a presentation on writing in a MIDI mode UI library. Uh, my name is Henry Rose. Uh, so in this talk, we'll be taking you through the, uh, taking you through some uh, sort of like tips and tricks to help get you started with writing your own a MIDI mode UI. Uh, so there's some slide numbers down in the lower right hand side here. Where if you have any questions, you can always just jot down that number and we can jump back to the slide where you need to, uh, yeah, where the question was. So, um, yeah, so we're going to start. Um, so, who am I? Uh, I'm a game developer of a game called FICO. I've created a, my own Amini Mojo library called VUI. You can ch check it out at the link here. I uh, currently stream Monday to Friday at 1 p.m. GMT on Twitch uh, with this link uh, over at this channel here. And uh, I have a Twitter as well where I post stuff sometimes. Okay, so here's the game called FICO. It's a uh, 2D fighting game, similar to something like Smash Brothers. Uh, but you can sort of make your own characters, make your own stages, make your own content and stuff. So uh, we've got a bunch of like, um, editors that are built in the game using the immediate uh, and immediate merge ui library so here's like an example of the the uh level editor where you can pick up objects move them around change their prefab your under and reading buttons and you can also add new objects as well so notice how this is kind of like a very uh advanced ui library where it's got Things laying out in columns, push the edge of the display. You've got backgrounds, images, rounded corners. Uh, yeah. So there's a whole range of features used to make this UI here. Uh, here's the example file in the VUI project. So if you go to the GitHub, you can see, you can actually test this out yourself and it, uh, you can build it and run it. Uh, so notice how we've got a range of different buttons, check boxes, radio buttons, text boxes, input boxes, sliders, text wrapping, uh, and also a scroll view as well uh, with a multi-line text box. So with the immediate mode formula, you're not limited by what you can do with them. It's just a, a different way of expressing the UI or how you, uh, how, you uh, how the code looks, right? So what makes a, immediate immediate mode UI different to a retain mode UI. So the, the the three key things take away. The user code runs every time some input comes in. So it, say if someone moves the mouse, you you know will read the rest of the input that's queued up and then you would up you would run the user's UI code again. And so we can call this thing a frame. So whenever you or, or in a game, you know, you run at 60 frames per second, for instance, and every frame you're going to update, you're going to run the user's UI code again. There's also no control objects in user code. So you don't have buttons, controls, grids in user code. So you don't manage any objects. Uh, so, so by not having this and this controlled by the system, it makes the UI code very dynamic, and it means you can change things on the fly, put if statements, use for loops around controls and dynamically create these things every time something changes. Uh, so the original sort of talk where I think this came from was uh, Casey Moratori's talk in 2005. I discovered, I discovered it much later after discovering uh, an immediate mode library, but um, yeah, there's a link to this video here. I strongly recommend watching this multiple times if you sort of like uh, want to learn more about its origins and the original idea, and also just to learn a little bit more about media mode UI libraries. Uh, Dear I'm GUI is kind of like the most popular C++ and probably, well, a media mode UI library out there, to be honest. Um, and this was first released in 2014. And its latest release actually came out the other day. Uh, and actually I had to change, update these slides. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I've taken lots of ins inspiration from this library. I've read through the code a lot. So I, I met, um, it's something I strongly advise you to do is find a popular library like this library here and just read through the code and analyze how it works. And uh, uh, another library as well is uh, Nuclear and C done by Mission McCap. And um, 
So this came out in 2016. It was actually inspired by Dear Aram Gui, and uh, well, I believe it was, uh, and is now maintained by uh, the community. So uh, Mitch McKay has actually moved on to working on an in-house UI library where uh, he works. And this is an immediate mode UI library as well. And you can kind of, uh, and also he's done, a, he's done a podcast with Ryan Fleury, which is the Handmade Podcast, episode three. And in this podcast, he was, uh, yeah, the, um, in this podcast, Ryan did a great, great job of extracting that information from him, sort of like how he is, so how he has uh, implemented this new immediate mode UI library in his workplace and sort of like the different iterations he had been through to get to the ideas that he will, he goes over. So um, I strongly recommend listening to this podcast like twice or maybe three times to fully uh, understand what's going on. Uh, understand, uh, you know, to fully understand it. Um, I, I kept going back, and I, every time I went back, I just got a new bit of information from it. So, um, yeah, I strongly recommend just going over these resources here because this is where I get I've got lots, lots of my ideas, and this is where most of these ideas that I'm about to show you come from. So, why an immediate mode UI library? So you can imagine this simple form here on the left hand side you've got a you got some labels or some text and on the right hand side you have some text boxes so there's first name last name and email obviously it's not sized like they would be in real life but it's an example so also as well at the bottom we've got some cancel and submit but uh, submit buttons and these are laid out in a grid of some sort as you can see they're very evenly laid out right So in a retain mode UI, something like uh, the web or like a WPF, it's all about dealing with these objects and things, right? Where you essentially have a base control and the control that you need to make for the form inherits from that base control, so it goes in that first slot. Now, you often have to store your children of your control somewhere. So we're grid, we've got the labels, got the text boxes, got the cancel and submit button. So this, uh, so when we, so this function here, the forum in it, this is like the constructor of the forum on the initialization. So what's key to take away from here is you want to come through this code when you initialize the form. So we initialize all the children controls, put some first name and last name in the labels, and in the button we put uh, the labels in there as well. Uh, and so on. So we move on to the next bit. Uh, so now after we've initialized the children controls, we then add the children controls to the grid. And you have to maybe do some funny casting to change to the base class or, or uh, you know, um, <clears throat> but also, um, and so notice how these ones are laid on the left-hand side. So these have the zeros here on the left, uh, which mean the first column. And these will lay out in the rows here, zero, one, two, three rows. And on the right-hand side, this is the second column uh, here. Um, yeah. So then after we've added all the controls into the grid and laid out in their appropriate cells, we can then have an event handler where we're effectively gonna have some callback functions that when maybe you click a button or something, you can then handle hey, this button's been clicked, what do I want to do about it? So essentially, what we end up having is these functions defined underneath that form initialization where you can handle, you can handle like when a button's been clicked. And so in here, maybe you're going to click a submit button and you end up having to, uh, you know, uh, maybe an error happens on the form and you need to put some errors down. What we're going to have to do is you're going to have to maybe go up the parent from this control of the uh, of the button, cast it back into a button, go up to the parent, try and find the the sort of like error message you want to display, maybe put the string in there as well. So all of the code that configures that goes into this other function here. And it doesn't necessarily sit alongside any of this layout code here, right? So it's kind of separated amongst the file. 
and it's it's not the most clearest thing and you always have to jump around this control tree and find where to put stuff uh and furthermore it that's it's a very static way of looking at it right so there's no dynamicness happening until you reach these uh callback functions so to make that sort of whole first uh example much neater uh the retain mode UI sort of have some uh, XML based file or maybe a JSON file. I don't know what some ones do, but primarily the XML based. And essentially you can see the same thing repeated again. You've got the labels that go into the first column. And notice how this time the grid can now be specified alongside the actual creation of the label. So it's a little bit cleaner and it's not separated on through like a page down or something uh, scroll, by scrolling down the page and seeing where it goes in the grid. So the data is kind of associated together here. And this is the text boxes on the right with a grid column of one and they evenly go out in the rows. So you can still do these on clicks and have like a string here to talk about the function. But this goes to show that this file here is actually then generated into maybe like a C file or a C sharp file. And you can then, it effectively generates that first slide that we saw of the examples. So you still have to have this callback function in some C code or C sharp code or something in a separate file. And that's just really separate stuff. So you, things that you can't do again is this is static. There's no dynamicness here. And it's, uh, so you can't dynamically insert controls or, or remove some controls on the fly without, hand, without going through these callbacks. So this is an example of an immediate emoji way where the difference is that the form this time has a bunch of strings where these are essentially like C++ standard, uh, standard string where these are uh, heap allocated where you can sort of like uh, push, more, push more bytes on the end or take some bytes off or something, right? So it's a, it's a dynamic string. So this UI form is called every frame. So you know every time the user moves the mouse or clicks a button on the keyboard, or maybe every time the game updates. So we're gonna step through here. And yeah, so notice how we, we pass this form into the function via a pointer, and all we have to care about is the data that comes in and the data that goes out. So this time, just to make it a, a little bit more like the XML file, we've laid it out, uh, out in the same row and stuff. So notice how we have this UI grid uh, uh, grid column row where we specify like what cell we want the next control to go into. So we essentially set it in some global state somewhere. And that means the next time we call, uh, we, we create a control, it's going to go inside this. Uh, it's going to go inside that the cell that you specified. So these are how we lay out the labels here. And then we move on to the next column, which will lay out the text boxes. And that's how we put the one in here this time, CV in the second column. And this time, we take an address of these strings. So if, you're, if your text box is focused and you press the key on the keyboard, say the last name text box is focused, press the key on the keyboard, it's going to update this last name here and put that, the key you pressed inside that string. Uh, notice how this time with the buttons, what they're going to do, they're going to return something called a focus state. Now this, fo now this focus state is just a bit set. Uh, I pressed back on LibreOffice and it didn't like it. There we go. So this focus state here is just a bit set. So when you return from a, a button, it will tell you exactly what state that button's in. Is it focused? Is it pressed, double pressed, held or released? It could be any number of these, it could be all of these. Uh, and you can sort of say, hey, has my button been released, which is the standard behavior of a button when you wanna act on it. So if you press the cancel button, you can immediately act on how you want that button to behave directly next to where it's laying out. If you don't like that, you, we have in a variable, so we can move it down to the end of the function. You can handle it at the end of the function. So it's still, it, you can still move it around if you want, or you could put the behavior right next to where the button is actually gonna be. Uh, so this is just an example of, it's just showing 
how dynamic an Medium UI library is, where this has actually resulted in more lines of code, but it's just showing you how you can stick these things in for loops. So you have the strings of, you have an array of labels here, they're just some strings. You can then uh, go over all these labels and we put the I in the row number here and the I in the labels, and it's just gonna print out those, well, sorry, it's just gonna create those three controls and same with the text boxes as well. So it just shows a very dynamic system. So how do we build controls? In, an, in a retainer UI, it's, it's kind of primarily object oriented, where you have maybe like a base control, you have a base button, and maybe they don't hear it, and the button is made from that thing. So you end up having lots of different classes and structures of, of things, and you end up having to manage all these different classes and structures and put them inside your code. Whereas in a media mode UI, we have a single structure and it's called a control. And if you can, if you can take many different structures and consolidate and down into a single structure, it often makes code a lot more simple because you don't have to worry about keeping function pointers around for the different behaviors of, of these classes. You don't have to worry about how do you allocate this thing because they're all different sizes, where does it go? And you don't have to worry, uh, uh, so you can think of the control as mainly having a bunch of different behaviors, like can it be focused? Can it be scrolled? Can we press down on the button? Is it selectable? And then the code inside is going to have some if statements inside the single function that you're going to call, and it's going to act on that behavior that you, do, you can turn on and off on the fly. So here's another example in Media Edge UI. This time I'm just going to take you sort of through this, uh, this function. I'll just give you a quick overview. There's a column that we're just gonna start. And all of these UI controls are gonna start with what's known as, as, as a sibling identifier. And we're, we're gonna use the line macro here, which is gonna uniquely identify the sibling amongst the other siblings. So this sibling identifier has to be unique for every control that has the same parent, okay? so. The, it ends with a style argument. And this can also be passed in, you can also pass in null here and the con control just won't have any style whatsoever. So we uh, start a column, which is gonna call a function called UI control start. And after start, it's gonna select a column layout. And yeah, so we move on. So when you, the, the next thing we wanna do is create a button. And this button is going to have two children. It's going to have an image and some text laid out in a column layout. So notice how with this button, we've selected a column layout just by calling a function. And so we create two buttons here. There's a cancel and accept, both laid out in a column. So there's two ways. Uh, so sorry. So let's take in a look at this stack way of building controls. So you can imagine as, as we enter this UI example when we update it for this frame, what we're going to do is completely get rid of completely get rid of the control stack and start again, every single frame. So we'll enter the column start. Here we go. We push this blue rectangle on here, and this is just the con, this. You think of this as the we're pushing that control structure that we saw that single control structure onto the stack. So when we come into the button start. We're going to push this control onto the stack two, and this one's red just to show you the, what's uh, show you the, the same the, the controls with the same siblings. Now we're going to move into the child of the buttons, where they have uh, some image and some text. And then, because we dispose of these controls every single frame, what we have to do when we reach the control end is we have to lay this button out inside the column. So it's going to look, in, look inside the column, see which controls have already been laid out in there, and then put it in the right place. So because there's nothing there, it just goes in the first section. And then when we come to the next button, this one is the same sibling as the other one, as the other button. And we go through and repeat it, repeat it again. This time when we do the button end, it's going to lay, lay out after this button here. Uh, so when we do the call button end, it's going to try and lay out inside its parent column. Okay. 
So the problems with doing this stack approach is you're doing too much all at once. So you're trying to build the controls for the stack. Uh, sorry, yeah, so you're trying to build the controls by pushing them on, on some form of stack. And then you're also trying to lay them out at the same time. So you don't have all the information that you need to sort of like do any, do any complicated layouts, like maybe filling the rest of the width of your parent. You don't have the ability to fill a ratio of the parent because say if you have that outer column control, it needs to know how big all of its children are gonna be before it can know how big it can be. So like uh, if the parent has automatic sizing, its size is determined by the size of its children. So how can the children be sized based on that sort of thing? So there's a, there's a very recursive sort of thing here. So um, you can't necessarily do that all in a single pass. The, um, and because you dispose of the controls every time, it makes animation a lot harder since you ha have to create the control each time. So effectively, you could maybe store the animation state somewhere else. But if you're storing the animation state somewhere else and preserving that, you might as well preserve. Uh, you might as well preserve the control state as well. So let's talk about the other approach. So this other approach here is by building a control tree. So you could think of when we go over this process here, you have an internal you have um, some internal build state pointers. And so there's a parent control pointer and a previous sibling control pointer. So we're gonna, we're gonna go over this frame. We can imagine there's no controls being made at all. This is the first time we're running over this. Now we're gonna go into this control start and notice I've got some line numbers here so we can keep track of these guys. So this one has a sibling ID of eight and now for show button, this iteration, show button is false, so we're gonna skip past this code. So this shows the dynamicness of the immediate enjoy. Now we're gonna, this button controls sibling identifier is 21. So we're gonna look for the current parent control. And we're gonna try and find 21 and its children. It has no children. So because this is a button start, what we're gonna do is create uh, we're going to create the control and we're going to assign it with the sibling ID of 21 and we're going to link it up as the first child because there's no previous sibling right now. And then we're going to move the parent pointer down to the control. So now we've, now this is the parent control. We're going to move down into its children and we're going to create the UI image. Now the UI image does a, a UI control start and a UI control end all in a single call because it's a primitive, it's a primitive UI control essentially. So you can imagine it starts and ends, which means what it's going to do is look for 25 in the current parent. Can it find 25 and under the children? No, it can't. So it's going to create a a new control at the current previous sibling. So because that's null, it's the first child. And then now that beca because the control ended, it's becoming the previous, the new previous sibling. So we point to the previous sibling. And now when we create the next sibling for this control, we're gonna look through all the children of parent. Can we find a sibling ID of 27? And there's only 25. So we're gonna insert this after the previous sibling so we can create that there and join them up. So notice how after we step through this first iteration here, we've just built a tree of controls as if you would in a retain mode UI, but it's done in a, an immediate mode. And now because this does a UI control start and a control end in a single call, it this now becomes the new previous sibling. So when you call the UI control end, what it's gonna do is move the parent pointer back up to its parent, and then the, this becomes the new previous sibling. So let's take a look at a future iteration when you already have this tree built. So we're gonna come down again and do this column start. Let's just say it gets the, the parent pointer assigned to here for the current build state. 
And this time show button is going to be true. So now we're going to make this new button here. We're going to look for number 11, a sibling identifier of 11. So we look for in the children of the parent, uh, there's only 21. So because there is no 11, we need to look at the current previous sibling pointer, that's null. So that means you need to insert it as the first child. So you create the control, make this the new first child, and then you link that up with where it used to point to. And now what we can do is make this control the parent because it's a start function and move in to process the children. So when we create this UI image, this does a start and an end. And again, because there's no previous sibling, we look through the parent, there's no controls. We uh, create a new control. Make this the previous sibling. And then for the text bun, we look for sibling control, sibling ID of 17, there's only 15. Insert it after the previous sibling and link them up. And because it ends a control, it becomes a new previous sibling. We call UI button end, move the parent back up the tree, make the control we just ended the previous sibling and move on to the next thing. So this is where we have to do something a bit different. So we already have, notice how we already have sibling ID of 21 in the tree. So we scan through, oh, we've got 21. So that means it's the same control and it's already, it already exists. So what you need to do is you need to remove it from the tree and insert it after the current previous, previous sibling because what you could do is actually dynamically move these controls all the way. You can move these controls around and they can be laid out in different orders because it's a very dynamic thing. But in this case, they're in the same order so they don't actually move around in the tree. So because this is a start function, it now becomes the new parent. And now we repeat the same process for the children controls where we look for 25, 25s exist, we remove it and insert it, it now becomes the new previous sibling and repeat and repeat. So when we get to the end, we move the parent back up to its parent and then, then that becomes the new previous sibling. So, so this, so by building these, this control tree, by stepping through all these controls, what you end up achieving, uh, so, so there's no layouts in this whatsoever you're essentially just taking a step over and just seeing what has changed in this step. Uh, in the, the initial, um, you're seeing what has changed when we just step over these, uh, the control trees so and if we need to remove any or if we need to put some new ones in. So now we have this tree we can recursively descend down and do a lot with. So what does the control structure look like? Well, we still have a, we still have some tree nodes as if we were in a retain mode UI. So you have the parent, your first and last child, and the previous and the next sibling that you can make by doing that process we just went over. There's the unique sibling identifier. So we don't use any hashing in this system. We just check to make sure that this is a unique ID. Um, when we do that pass and build the tree, when we come across the same control, we update it to say, hey, we came across it in uh, this frame index. So that means when we lay out the controls, if the frame index is a mismatch from the current frame, then we can just get rid of the whole control subtree from here and just get rid of it because it wasn't called this frame we updated. There's also this positioned rectangle on the screen that's used for laying out and rendering. Uh, there's a layout type. Since every control can be anything, it could also lay out controls however it likes. It, it can lay out its children however it likes. So it, here is an example of a row, column, or grid layout. We have a uh, some control flags here. And these are the things that we use to enable uh, certain behavior within the control if it's focusable, scrollable, and things like that. There's this thing called a focus state, where, which is the thing that gets controlled from the UI button. And the, well, the UI button, uh, so, we, so, so we actually use this focus state to keep track if something's hovered, uh, clicked, double clicked, and things like that. Uh, as you saw with that bit set earlier. The other step, uh, sorry, the other fields here are control offset X and control offset Y. So if you can scroll horizontally or vert vertically, 
these things can be used, but they don't have to be used if, but, sorry, but they're not used if the flags aren't enabled. The next thing is this control state. The control state tells you if you're focused, active or disabled. With this, uh, this is the single highest priority state. So the control could be focused or disabled at the same time, something like that. And we need to just boil it down into a single state that it is. So you could be focused uh, so if you're focused or disabled, the highest priority is the disabled state. So it's in this order here from right to left. So disabled takes priority over active and focused and active takes priority over focused. Uh, default is just always on. It's just, it's, just, uh, it's just the default state if it wasn't focused, active or disabled. Uh, so how do we keep track of these states? considering all this does is keep track of the single high pass priority state. Well, there's a bunch of flags for each of these enumerations. There's a bit for each of these guys. And essentially you just boil it, you keep track of if it's focused, active, disabled, and just boil it down into that single enum. Uh, the stars is just a single structure for every single type of control. And there's an array of these guys that we just store in here and we index this with the current state of the control. So if it's focused, we can get the focused style and how we need to render that. Or if it's disabled, we can get the disabled version. And you can also have a lot more state if you have a bunch more functionality in your UI library. <clears throat> so here's an example of the control flags. We have the, like a focusful bit so if this is enabled, the control can be focused. So if you press tab on the keyboard or click it with the mouse, it gains focus. Oh, sorry, if you hover it with the, uh, with the mouse. So you also have a pressed, uh, pressable, flag, toggleable, and selectable. These tell you what the word active means. So how does the word active in the control state work? So pressable means that if you press down on the press down on the control. Uh, so while you're pressing down on the control, it is active. So like a button, you can think about it as pushing it in. And while it's been pushed in, it's active. Toggleable, if it's toggleable, it means you, as soon as you click it in, it toggles the current active state. And selectable means as soon as you press it in, it just becomes active and just gets set to active. So you can think about the toggleable for like a checkbox or a toggle button. Pressable for regular buttons, selectable for uh, things like a radio button where the, it needs to be just set and solely just set. And you can manually unpick the active state of another control when one becomes active. Uh, and then there's some scrollable things that you can enable here as well. So the control style, this is just like essentially stolen from like CSS where you have like margin, pattern, background color, border color, border width, and radius. So every con control can have these things. If it doesn't have them, you just, if it, sorry, if it doesn't have a background color, you just set that to transparent. If it doesn't have a border, you can make the color, color transparent or the border width uh, zero. And radius as well, so it can have like rounded corners and whatever to look pretty. But you can also define some more things here that can uh, optionally be enabled through, uh, through like flags or maybe hold children's styles and things like that. There's a bit more. Um, yeah. So how does so how can we make controls using uh, using these uh, this minimum UI? So you call those functions as we saw earlier with like the UI button start. So here's a UI button start and it calls a control start. So this is like the base function. We uh, guess we're inserted into the tree going over the process that we saw earlier. So it's just gonna find its location in the tree based on the sibling identifier, either create a new control or return you an existing one. And then, uh, so one of the flags that comes in is the, so the arguments that come in are the sibling identifier, the control flags and the styles. We just store the, uh, the flags that to find the behavior and the style inside the control. We can change these on the fly each time, but they probably won't change. Next up, we have an update control state. What this is going to do is see if you're the currently 
mouse focus control. If you are, have you clicked down? So does that change your active, does that change your focus state maybe? Or does, is your, does your control behave like a button? So if it's pressed down, do I need to set my active state and how do I change that? This is all called within that function when you start the control. Next up, uh, so because this is a control start function, we need to set some global state somewhere to say that this control that we've just started is the new parent and that previous sibling pointer that we saw earlier just gets set to null because there's no previous sibling when you start the control. Next up, when we end the control, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to get the current parent. So because the start made the control, we just made the parent, we can get, get it again by scanning the parent pointer from the OS system. And we set the parent to the parent of this control. And then the previous sibling becomes the control we just ended. So this is how simple it is to make something like a button when everything is uh, when things that can just be turned on inside the control start. So we simply just call control start passing a sibling ID and now we pass in things we want to enable. So for a button, it can be focus and a button is pressable, meaning as you, while the mouse or the keyboard is pressed down, the button is active and will show it as if it's pushed in. And then you pass in the array of styles so we know how to render that thing. Next up, we get the parent control and we get the parent control because it was a start function, the parent control is the button. And we just return the focus state, which is set when we update the control state inside the control start. Uh, to end a button, we can just call control end because there's no special behavior behind this sort of control. So this is how a toggle button differs from a regular button. Like you can give it a different style if you want, but that's up to the user. But as the library maker, all we have to do is swap out that pressable flag for a toggle ball to say, hey, when you click down on that button, it's going to toggle that active state. So the style is going to be active or not active if you toggle on, if you click on it. Then when we get back the parent control, this time we just check to see what the current state is. If the state is active, we're going to return true. So then the user can say, if this button is on and pushed in, then we can act on that. And uh, then toggle a button, uh, a toggle button ends the uh, same way as the regular button. We just call UI control end. So now we've taken a We've taken a look at how, how to sort of like build controls and how controls are built and how, what the control, how they're laid out. Let's take a look at a, uh, let's, let's zoom out a bit and just take a look, look at what a frame consists of. So there's a logic side and a rendering side. So let's uh, zoom into this logic side here. So the logic side obviously happens first and then we move on to rendering later. So the logic side is comprised of these three things. You get some user from the input, uh, sorry. <laughs> Get some input from the user, and the, and, and the user side will pass it into the into the UI library. So the the user has to somehow transform the input so the system understands it. Then the system is going to act on that input, and then there's the build UI phase, where this is entirely the user where they do like a UI form and they make a form that they can build that control tree with, but they don't have to do anything with that tree. It's purely system side that does that. And then at the end, the user is going to call uh, the fact that it's ended by the logic, and then it's just going to lay out all the controls for you. So here's an example of a frame here where we have some, we have the app state here. And here's the form that we saw earlier where it's just got the strings in there, just, just got the data, no controls, right? Just got the strings in this structure. So here is some input state. Now this input state is grabbed from something like SDL, GLFW. So it's just a mouse XY, some UI actions and some text input to say what text has been pressed on the key, what, what, key, what keys have been pressed to make some text that we can then pass into the focused text box. So it's just separating that stuff from the UI library. So what does this UI actions actually do? So in SDL2 and GLFW, they just, they define a bunch of scan codes 
And if you want to make like a UI library, you don't necessarily want to re-implement a bunch of scan codes and key codes to tell what keys have been pressed and make the user use these things or whatever. It just, it's just too much of a, when you're trying to make a library, it's too much of what a framework actually does, where it tries to be everything and do everything. You just want to lay out some UI for someone and maybe render it too. So what we can do is split it down into some actions. So this is just a bit set where you set, where the user just sets some bits. Well, the, the user doesn't actually have to set, set some bits. You can write a little shim layer that, that translates SDL2 events or GLFW events into these buttons, sorry, into these actions. So all, all, all the, uh, the someone, someone making that translation shim, it's a very tiny thing. All they have to do is if the left key is pressed, set a bit that says the left key has been pressed and right key, down key, up key, enter space, just some very basic things that the core controls will have to know about, but they don't have to know about like the A, they don't have to know about like the keyboard layout or if the A key has been pressed or the B key has been pressed, those things don't actually matter. So it's just actions, right? So, so you can do things like navigate around key, uh, text boxes and things like that. The user doesn't really have to use these things. They can use something like SDL2, like they already have, or GLFW, they can use their abstraction they already have, and they don't have to worry about this thing at all. So all, all these has to do is set these bits here. So these are the single key actions they have to set. Then there's some two key actions that they have to set for something like undo and redo and copy and paste and select all. So the key thing is to take away uh, that there's these two special bits here, control and shift. So we end up, what this allows us to do because they're bit flags is the user has to fill out these, these two groups only. And this third group is automatically filled out. So that means in the system side, you can just check for these keys first. And if these keys are pressed, you don't have to handle their lower order uh, versions. So for instance, select left is shift and left. So the shift uh, bit flag here combined with this left one, combine them two together, it will automatically have this combination here. And if you hold the control key, there's a control key one with the shift and left and the control all combined together as well. So now we've gone over how you would, <clears throat> you can make a very simple uh, abstraction or a very simple sort of way to get the input into the UI library. All you have to do is call some functions that sets those in some global state somewhere. And now the system knows about them. So now you can call this UI frame start function where you're just going to tell the UI library that you want to start a frame and start building some controls. So what does this UI frame start look like? Let's just take a quick glance. If you if you don't have root control, we're going to make a root control so we can start somewhere. Next up, we're going to rec recursively descend down the existing tree that we already have. So last frames tree that has been updated, that tree structure that you saw earlier, we're just going to recursively descend down that and find where the mouse is situated. Is it over and find what control the mouse is hovered over. Uh, so it's, it will set some global state somewhere to say, hey, th this control uh, at this pointer or control identifier or something is, is, uh, is hovered over. Next up, you're going to process those input actions that we saw earlier. So if there's a keyboard, so if there's a uh, text box that's focused and you press the left key, it's going to move left in the text box field. Uh, then we're just going to set up the build phase by making the root control the new parent. And then because it's starting a new control, the sibling parent, the previous sibling control is just not. So after you start the frame, you, the user can now just build its controls and update that control tree and handle if a button's been pressed or something all in their user side code. And then afterwards, you're going to lay out the controls by recursively descending down that tree. And uh, yeah, so, so 
when we call frame end, all it's going to do is recursively descend down the existing tree from the root control and lay out the controls. So you, you probably have to set up some state. So we're going to call this thing called uh, layout start, where we're just going to set up some state internally, do the recursive descent starting from the root control, and then we're going to finalize the layout. So the reason why you might have to finalize the layout is because when you recursively descend down the tree, uh, in my UI library, we actually, if you go back to the control structure, there's that rectangle that's positioned on the screen. When we lay out the controls, we actually don't set an absolute position. We just set a relative position from its parent. So it's just, so the whole way down, it's just, it's just a relative offset from its parent's position. And the reason why we do this is because if you have like a right to left layout or a left to right layout, you're gonna have to, you can swap things around last minute. And also means that, uh, also, it also makes other things a lot easier too. But I think it also makes doing pop over control logic a lot easier. So I consider reading through the code when you do layout speak, uh, sorry. Uh, the, so we're not gonna go over any, uh, any layer, lay, um, we're not gonna go over any layout examples today because there's loads of different ways you can do this. And it's kind of like, this is where you can make your library have its own twist. So it just uh, this is where I've taken a look over something like my UI library VUI or DRM GUI and see how those libraries do it and see what sort of direction it'll take your library. So the finalized function in my VUI library, what it'll do is recursively descend down the tree again and give the controls an absolute, uh, it will accumulate the, the uh, it will accumulate the uh, position of the controls as it goes down the parent, and it just gives them an absolute position, depending if you have a left to right or a right to left layout. And then afterwards, because we've en ended the frame, this is the last, this is where the logic ends. So we just clear the input for the next frame. So this means the UI actions don't get reused next frame and other things like that. So that's the logic side done. The next thing is the rendering. Uh, we're not going to touch on the rendering today because that's a whole other system that we could really go into. But I'll just give you a bit of, a little bit of advice of take a look at the RM GUI or my UI library because I really, I, I, I went, my library is heavily inspired by how DRM GUI has done it. And it's, it's, it has its own unique twist as well. But the, the design of the rendering API is, uh, is sort of like, it does in a very nice way where it doesn't care if you use an OpenGL DirectX or a software renderer. It just pumps out some vertices and some indices and some draw calls, and it lets you pass that into OpenGL in a very elegant way. So I strongly recommend you look at that. But the, the, key, the key process is the same as laying the controls out. You start the root control and you just recursively descend down this tree that you have access to now. All your controls are laid out and you can just render those things. So yeah, just strongly recommend reading the uh, resources that have been provided in this talk. Okay, that's, uh, that's the, uh, um, yeah, that's the talk. So um, yeah, I hope everyone got a, uh, got some uh, good pointers on where to sort of start with a UI, with their medium UI library and uh, some resources to look at too. So has anybody got any questions? Cheers, um, I had a question. Oh, go, go, ahead, Mike. go ahead, Mike. Um, for your game, were there certain requirements that you had um, where you felt like writing your own um, immediate mode UI library was needed? Like, was it something that you couldn't use Nuclear or um, the IM GUI to do that you needed? Or, right. or was it mostly for your own interest? Right, that's a good question. Well, first thing is that I've used a lots of like retainer UI libraries myself, and I always like interested in like what what I could like what I could build like in a very simple way because I've always seen lots of other complicated things. So I always wanted to always wanted to sort of build my own and see how simple or see how well I could make it in comparison to something like those things. Um, but I but uh, my game is also in C, uh, and 
there are MQEs in C++ and I know there are some C bindings, but I kind of like to have my C code in a single translation unit and include all my dependencies. So that wasn't necessarily the right route. And also as well uh, with nuclear, uh, the original person sort of like abandoned the project, uh, Mitch Maquette, and it's now maintained by the community. And, you know, I, uh, I still could have used that, and uh, but I just wanted again to sort of like try making my own sort of thing as well. Like, um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, oh, that's another thing as well. Uh, DRM GUI is a debugging. You uh, is it, it's made for making debugging UIs. I wanted to make a UI library that could be used to. Uh, it could be styled. However, I like so this is why I have the styling options, and also so it can be used for uh, making game tools, but also be make, uh, made to uh, make applications in as well. Uh, so that, that's the intention behind that. And I think Nuclear does offer that, but it's it's um, I think it's not as simple as this solution that we went over today. But yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed missed this um, earlier in the talk. Um, okay. So you uh, you're building a tree with um, all of the um, all of the UI elements. Yeah. Um, and then you get the um, uh, so basically what, what I'm wondering is how how does because you lay out after you've done the interaction using yeah. the tree. How does the user know whether the um, uh, whether the item has been pressed or not? But like, if if you right. haven't if yeah. you haven't decided where the rectangle for the button is, how can you tell yeah. whether the so last frame? Is? So the previous frame, you have the tree built, right? Um, yeah. So I, I kind of had to speed over a bit, but yeah. So if you go to this frame start. Okay, so it's, it's a one frame lag from the... Yeah, so there's a one frame lag. Okay, which yeah. You can feel a bit, uh, but it's not entirely, like, it's not, it doesn't, like, create problems. It kind of just, like, the user might feel it a bit if they're really looking for it, but just the average user wouldn't really feel it too much. So there's one frame lag where there's the, <clears throat> there's the, tr there's the uh, controller, there's a, there's a, you look at the last frames control tree, scan down it, and then you find the mouse focus control there and you, you then make that a new focus control. It, so, is it, yeah. Sorry, is it, um, is it doing the interaction from the last frame or is it doing the interaction from the current frame but with the positions from the last frame? Yes, yeah, so it's using the positions from the last frame, but the input that comes in is yeah. from the, Current. For the latest, yeah. yeah for the late, there's the latest input. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, yeah. Um, um, and I guess maybe a related question. Um, uh, are you? Is there any point at which the memory gets freed, or items get freed, or like if you're using an arena, like that it gets reset? So in VUI, what we use is we use a pool, and we don't use pointers. We use uh, thirty-two bit identifiers with counters to check for if something has been freed twice or or something but when you lay out the controls what you can do is because this is your first time you're looking over the tree after it's been built you check to make you check the uh uh, uh there we go see so there's this thing called a last frame index when you do the control start and you build the uh. put it in the tree you say hey this is the last, the latest frame index. So when you do a frame start, you might increment that number, right? It, that's in your global state somewhere. And so when you pass over them again, you go, oh, this is the latest frame. So when you do a layout end, uh, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> so when you do a frame end and you go over the tree and build all the controls up, what, you, what you, we have to do is you look out for this number to see if it differs on the control. And if it differs, then you can basically just take the tree, you can take this whole subtree out and just delete it. Or what you can do is, uh, or, or what you can do is you can slowly phase it out and animate it out. It's completely up to you how you want to do it. But it just basically means this thing is dead. What do you want to do about it? 
Like, so that's is that any time it stops getting shown, basically? Yeah. So this is yeah. yeah so so if this differs from the current frame, that's when the the user hasn't updated it this time. The controls updated, so therefore it's not the, the user doesn't want it anymore. So therefore you can just choose how you want to. Maybe your UI library just gets rid of it right away, or maybe it animates it out. You can uh, yeah. work that into your library. Is there a way that you can like? Um... Say that you have a, a window which is hidden at the moment. It, can you like iterate over all the elements in the window and just say, "Don't do anything with this. Just keep it around for the moment." Uh, sorry. Can you? Uh, what, what do you mean by? Oh, 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 yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So say, so, the, yeah. So your application window is not active. Yeah. Yeah. So the frame only gets updated when any user input comes in for an application. Mm -hmm. But if it's a game, you update every time the game updates. But yeah. You can also choose to not do it if no mouse movement has happened to. It's completely how, up to you, how you strike, how you, uh, it's only when the frame actually up, or when you need to update the UI, you can uh, rerun the build code or the user's build code. Do you, do you have the concept of like internal windows? Uh, yeah, in the UI we have uh, different windows for like, if you have different uh, native application windows, but we don't have like like internal like panel type things. Okay. Uh, but I did work on a branch for that, and then I sort of like stopped halfway. So I I, I have sort of uh, working towards that. But yeah, in that sense, you would have like a different abstraction with different windows, and each have their own root control, and sort of like have different trees, right? Uh, but yeah. So if you if you close a window, um, so you do some like laying out in the window, um, yeah. maybe like a, a tree hierarchy or something. I'm not sure whether that's possible, but that kind of thing. Uh, and then you close the window and then you open the window again. Right. Will, the, will have you have lost all of the layout or is there a way of keeping that around? Uh, if you close the, you talk, you're talking about the, uh, you're talking about closing like a native a window or like something that's built or like a, or like something that's like internal to the win uh, so say like a DRM GUI's windows where they yeah. just embedded in the in the window is it like that uh could, could be either way yeah um, yeah well um I, i'm just wondering if you can if there's a way of having persistence for stuff that isn't visible right yeah so you could yeah you could so you, it, de it depends how you want to recycle that sort of thing you could be like hey, i closed this window does that mean we're going to keep keep the state around or do we just free all that memory and yeah. start again next time uh, but i don't think there's any benefit to keeping it around like because it only takes a frame to get it well no, when, like, you when you open it back up it comes back because you just iterate over the build code again and it just builds the the, the tree again and it gets rendered right but, but say you've like uh if you, do you have scroll bars say, say you've, yeah, scrolled, you've scrolled halfway bars. say you've yeah. scrolled halfway down so that's like GUI state, but not um, yeah, not so state. Or, or do you, or does the yeah. user keep that separately, and they can? Yeah. So in in my UI library, we have. Uh, can I shoot to it quickly? <laughs> um, uh, then, boom! Uh, scroll view. So we have a concept called a scroll view, where one of the parameters is the current content offset, and that's a pointer. So you can basically have a vector to uh, so an x, y position, and the user can store that in their in their form, right? They can store it alongside that first name, last name, and yeah. they can stick it where it's scrolled and where its position is, and they can change it too. Okay. There's also yeah. resizing information as, as well. Right, so so pushing that data onto the user means that you don't have to worry about it when you reset your code, and yeah, yeah. that, yeah, that so works out nicely. It, but yeah. you can also pass in null and let the uh, not have to worry about storing it in user code. So you can provide the flexibility. Nice. For, uh, yeah. For that, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I like it. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Um, any, any other questions? Cool. Um, so yeah, I, I guess the uh, slides I will uh, 
get the slides together and remove the videos so I can make them a lot easier to access so people look at them later. Um, yeah. Awesome. Sweet. So, so uh, yeah, you don't have a, a hash based ID, do you? Is that right? Uh, no, we don't use hashing. So it's all it's all just the offset in, into the array of controls. Yeah, so we have a thing called a sibling identifier. Yeah, yeah. Where, yeah, so it has to be unique for the current sibling. You can put assertions in the control start function where you essentially the you know basic the the most the the most uh, just just the general control start function where if if the uh, control has already been updated this frame, and you and you come across another sibling ID with the same number, then it's just going to assert and crash the program. So you can keep track of these duplicate things, and also it's very easy to keep get a unique number with just the line number macro. But what's special is you can actually pass in a an enumeration, for instance, and you can use this. All right, okay, it's buff overs here again. So we go to the radio button. We use the sibling identifier here. I think DRM GUI does the same sort of thing in a way. It allows you to pass in an integer and it's just a random integer. But here we use the sibling identifier uh, on the, so you pass it in in this, in this radio button. It returns uh, true if it's selected, but uh, there's a pointer that's stored in some user state. Uh, somewhere, so like the form, and this tells you the selected sibling identifier. So, if uh, you know if, if you use an enumeration for the sibling ID, like you know you might have red, green, blue, and it will return red, green, blue out by this pointer. Nice. Like yeah, yeah. It's quite handy. It's quite nice. 